Okay. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to From Challenge to Opportunity, a tale of two transcription projects. I'm Jim Cross, and I am the manuscripts archivist from Special Collections and Archives of the Clemson University Libraries. My co-presenter today is Krista Oldham, our university archivist. Next slide. Okay, this is what we hope to do today. We're going to describe the challenge we face with the closure of the university libraries due to COVID-19. We're going to show how this challenge became an opportunity for special collections and archives to broaden access to both digital versions of oral histories and manuscript collection and to familiarize other library staff with the work that we do. We're going to describe some of the collections that are part of the projects, describe the planning process for the projects, describe the tools we use for onboarding, project management, and communication, and share some of the lessons we learned in the course of planning and implementing the projects. And then we will have time for questions. Next slide, please. Okay. The challenge, yeah, this thing, COVID-19. We went from preparing to work from home to, well, guess what? Starting next week, you'll be working from home. Unfortunately, for some libraries employees and student workers, most of their work required them to work on site. There was a limited amount of work that they could do from home and that work would quickly be exhausted. How could the libraries keep their employees and students productive with projects that would advance the library's mission? Next slide, please. The opportunity. Well, meanwhile, special collections had a number of oral histories that needed to be transcribed. In addition, there were also digitized university archives series and manuscript collections in Tiger Prince, the library's institutional repository that also needed to be transcribed. Why not have those libraries, employees, and student workers do the transcribing? while at the same time improving the accessibility and usability of those collections as well. As an added bonus, those involved in the projects would gain insight into archival materials and particularly the holdings of special collection, learn a little more about the work that we as archivists do, and learn of skills that might prove to be useful in the future. Next slide. So, what are we what are we transcribing? Nearly 60 oral histories are included in the in the oral history transcription project and cover a wide variety of topics. They include interviews with George B. Hartzog Jr., who worked for the National Park Service for 26 years, the last eight years of which, 1964 to 1972. He served as its seventh director. Hartzog increased the acreage in the national parks by 10% and during his tenure saw attendance at the parks more than double. He was a passionate supporter of the National Park Service and American parks in general. Textile history is represented by the Henry Cater Collection and the Daniel Wegner Oral History Collection, which document life in the mill village of Newry, South Carolina in the early 20th century. For both black and white residents working for the Courtney Mills Man Manufacturing Company there. The William Wright Bryan papers contain interviews by and with Bryan, a newspaper and radio journalist who became editor for the Atlanta Journal and the Cleveland Plain Dealer. In addition to documenting his journalism career, there are 
recordings of his June 6, 1944 D-Day broadcasts and his recollections of the day 40 years later. Another collection relating to military history is the Randolph Scott collection. It mainly consists of a set of audio tape journals kept by an African-American soldier describing events to his family during his service in the Vietnam War. Tragically, Scott was killed four days before his 21st birthday. The Black Heritage in the Upper Piedmont of South Carolina collection was the result of a project to document the history of local Black communities of South Carolina's Upper Piedmont during the period 1865 to 1920. The oral histories that are part of the collection describe family ancestry, the economic profile of residents, religious life, education, and social interaction in those communities. Finally, among the oral histories being transcribed is the collection that covers a topic near and dear to the hearts of tigers everywhere, Clemson Athletics. The Joseph L. Arbina Ipte Oral History Collection documents the history of the team, the operations of the Clemson Athletic Department, and most of all, the first 50 years, 1934 to 1984, of its fundraising arm, Ipte. Ipte stood for I pay 10 a year. As you might expect, the amount has increased significantly since 1934. Within the University Archives series, in the written documents transcription project, we concentrated on transcribing the early handwritten minutes of the Clemson College Board of Trustees and of meetings of the college faculty. They include the earliest meeting of the Board of Trustees in 1888. I should note here that South Carolina accepted Clemson's bequest the, a year later in 1889, and the university itself did not open until 1893. But both the Board of Trustees and college faculty minutes are vital in tracing the early development of what was then Clemson College. The one manuscript collection we included as part of the project, the Thomas Green Clemson Papers, is also the single largest collection being transcribed. Clemson, of course, is the founder of Clemson University. Next slide, please. Planning. Well, as you can see, there was a great deal to do to develop the infrastructure of the project, to test things out, and to train employees and student workers who would be doing the work. Creating the guidelines, we were able to move quickly with these because Krista had already conducted oral history projects in her previous position at Haverford College. And I had attended the Institute for the Editing of Historical Documents in 2019. So both of us were familiar with what other projects were doing and standards and guidelines, such as Columbia University Center for Oral History Researches. Wow, that's a long <laughs> title. 2018 Oral History Transcription Style Guide and Editing Historical Documents written by Michael E. Stevens and Stephen B. Berg in 1977 that we could use and adapt to our projects. Developing workflows for transcription and review. Again, we were familiar with workflows from other projects. It was just a matter of adapting them to the local situation and for the tools we decided to use. Speaking of those tools and how we determine which ones to use, we decided very early on that to save time, we would use tools already to handle. For example, we were already using Trello for student projects. Uh, Krista, much more experience with using Trello than I was. So I was able to piggyback on her layouts to come up with the layouts for my own project. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> Develop an onboarding procedures and training for transcribers, reviewers. We needed onboarding procedures to keep track of who was involved in the project and to ensure that each person signed the confidentiality agreement. Once we had guidelines, workflows, and tools, we needed to develop a training regimen for our transcribers and reviewers. 
our test group was special collections staff and students. It was small enough group so that we could get feedback quickly on whether the workflows well flowed and whether the training was sufficient so that people could start working with some confidence that they knew what they needed to do. Developing communications between transcribers and reviewers and project managers. A method for transcribers to ask questions of the project managers was one of the first things we thought of. It wasn't until a little later that we realized the utility of having a second list where transcribers could not only talk to the managers, but to each other. Next slide, please. I said that we had a lot to do. We also did not have a lot of time to do it. All of this was done in a little over two weeks. So here is the timeline. Uh, we were planning for closure. Uh, much of that planning that was being done was to determine what services we could still provide our patrons during the pandemic and how we would deliver them the, the uh, continuity planning. Um, now, certainly working from home was, was not neglected in the plan, plan, planning process, setting up the logistics of that and so on. But a lot of the initial planning was, you know, as you might expect for librarians and archivists, kind of outward focused. Um, so suddenly on the 16th, we're told we're going to be working from home. We were asked to start planning the transcription projects after some brainstorming. Um, the brainstorming, we were looking at projects, you know, that our own staff could do. But when we started thinking of transcription, it quickly realized that, hey, you know, this is something that we could open up to library staff and stu students outside of uh, Clemson Unit of Special Collections. And, and that would probably be a great help to uh, those other units. Uh, so we started creating guidelines and Trello boards and training, all of that through the 23rd, March 23rd through the 27th. Um, turning pro collections into projects was a relatively quick process for the oral histories, the Board of Trustee minutes and faculty minutes. So there was enough projects available for people to get started. The Clemson papers, however, were a different story. The final transcription project wasn't added to the Trello boards until the first week of July. So we made revisions as a result of our, our test. We provided training to library staff. Most of that was on the 31st and to April 1st, but we did have some stragglers come in uh, folks who joined later, and we began onboarding process, made revisions as the issues came up. And then the following week, we made more revisions um, as a result of people starting to work on, on material, and the second listener was created. Uh, I should say that revisions does not stop at the beginning of April. Especially in the early going, we needed to revise our guidelines to take into account problems discovered as people transcribe the materials. At this point, I will turn the presentation over to my colleague, Krista Oldham, who will talk about the tools we use and the lessons we learn planning and conducting these projects. Thanks, Jim. Um, as Jim had mentioned, one of the things that we determined during the planning stages was what tools would we use to administer the project. In making that determination, we asked ourselves, what could we afford? What did we already have access to? What combinations of tools could afford us the most efficiency? And how would our participants interact with the tools? And how easy would the tools be to use? Um, we additionally had to consider, again, who, was, who would be using these tools? As we, as, um, we started the project, we ended up um, started the project, like Jim said, with special collections, and then that 
that number grew to um, individual individuals outside of special collections. So we ended up having 37 participants who were both library um, employees uh, and student workers. Um, and some of those participants were familiar with special collections, understood the nature of what we do as archivists to make collections accessible. And we also had participants who were not familiar with special collections at all. Um, it um, is also fair to say that each of the participants came to the project with their own set of skills and familiarity with technology. And so we basically needed to keep it simple and not to overburden people um, with having them to learn a whole new technology or a whole new system. Taking all of this into account, we ended up using five tools that we already had access through, um, we already had access to through Clemson that people were familiar with and one freely available um, tool. Um, the first set of tools that, um, that we used aided us with that um, onboarding process to get those participants um, introduced to the project. In the chaos of uh, what I call now the great pivot, um, we, we needed a quick and easy way for people to sign up to work on the project and basically gather some um, data about um, about who they were um, for us as project leads because again we needed to onboard them we needed to provide them access to materials uh, essentially um, we knew that uh, that people were coming from the library and we wanted to know who they were um, get their contact information and roughly which projects they were most interested in working on um, so what we did um, is what any person would do, and that was to create a quick and dirty Google form, um, and, uh, and that's what we did. Um, the Google form worked great. It captured the information and populated it into a spreadsheet, which we uh, then added a couple of other columns to, um, which we used to track participants' onboarding progress. So it, it somewhat functioned like a master spreadsheet. Once we had their contact information, we were able to send out some initial communications that included instructions to watch a couple of videos on how to create um, that account with that freely available tool and enable um, some other tools that we would be using throughout the project, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Additionally, as, as Jim had mentioned, we asked participants to sign a confidentiality agreement, which we used uh, Adobe PDF, um, PDF sign, to acknowledge that some of our material was unprocessed and might contain sensitive information. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, and I, I don't think too many people came across anything, but we wanted to do that, um, which is a process that when we have students um, working in special collections, we have them acknowledge that information as well. Um, with the with that confidentiality agreement in hand, we could then start using their provided credentials to grant them access to materials that they would need for the project. Um, we used Box to um, store our data, um, which included those instructional documentations, templates, and the audio and text files. Using Box was the easiest way to provide access to the project files because we could um, very easily control access to the content and what participants could do to that content using their university credentials. We also chose Box because it was accessible via a web browser and it did not require participants to use the VPN, which I know is much more secure but um, is a little fickle at times and can be a little ornery and kick you off randomly. Um, <laughs> But uh, the overall management of the project took place in Trello. For those who are not familiar with Trello, um, Trello is a collaborative tool that organizes your projects into boards. Uh, I like to think of it as a ginormous board that I can put sticky notes on. Um, we use Trello to manage the workflows and serve as a one-stop shop to access project details and links to access the materials that were um, being stored in Box. Uh, we also, in construction, Constructing that Trello board, as Jim kind of mentioned earlier, wanted to um, make the workflow simple. We also, um, as possible, um, and we think Trello really helped us uh, achieve that. 
Um, this is a, a snapshot of one of our Trello boards. This is for the oral history transcription. Um, each card that you can see on here, uh, minus the ones that are the onboarding and resources, those were just cards that allowed um, people to access those um, project templates and documentation, but all the other ones represent oral histories. Um, each card had a link out to the box files and a checklist that helped um, guide participants on what to do. Additionally, each card allowed for participants to assign themselves to a project so that we knew and that their supervisors knew who was doing what um, for each of the transcription projects. And this was great to, again, track progress um, and also uh, it was a way to kind of potentially anticipate what sort of support we needed to provide as project leads um, for a particular set of either documents or oral histories. Um, and I also, um, as, I, as Jim had mentioned earlier, want to add that we tried to make the management of the project projects and the workflows very similar to each other because we wanted to have that flexibility for participants to move very seamlessly through the um, between the two projects so we really were looking to align the workflows so that um, it wasn't going to be so jarring if somebody did a couple of oral histories and wanted to try their hand at doing some document transcription so the workflows and the cards and the Trello board look very much the same. Um, the last kind of chunk of tools that uh, we used were geared towards communication and training, which um, were incredibly central to the project. We utilized WebEx to train people on the project, um, and it worked out well. In hindsight, I'm much more familiar with Zoom, so I might have uh, used Zoom, but we were in the kind of throes of, again, you saw Jim's timeline, getting the project up and running, and, um, and WebEx at that point in time was the dominant platform that Clemson was using. And, and, it, and again, it worked out perfectly fine. Um, we held a couple of different training sessions at the launch of the project to kind of introduce people to the both of the transcription projects and then have separate drilled down training on the oral history transcription project and the document transcription project. Um, again, we, we held a couple of different trainings for um, new participants and sometimes we would have um, smaller group participants if a supervisor wanted to bring their students on to have an individualized training so they could understand what their student workers would be working on so we had that type of training I also you know engaged in some one-on-one -on -one training for people that had uh, at first anticipated starting right off on these transcription projects but work or other things pulled them away and then they were coming back to this um, the transcription project maybe weeks later. So we had a couple of different trainings as people kind of came um, back to the project. Um, as I said, um, you know, the communication was very important. The training sessions were incredibly central to the transcription project because as much as we tried to simplify things, um, there are just a lot of moving parts that um, people would have to engage with. And so, um, uh, uh, we we tried our best to again make it simple but the reality is is a lot of moving parts and um and in some cases this type of work was so very different from what um, people were the participants were doing in their normal day-to-day -day work so we knew that um, the training had to be really on point um, in addition to WebEx as a communication and training tool, we used the listservs as Jim had mentioned. We ended up creating two listservs. That first one was really geared towards participants able, um, being able to email the project leads to ask questions and for us to provide clarification to um, participants. And uh, as Jim had said, we really um, realized later that um, we needed to create a second uh, listserv for people to communicate with each other. Um, people wanted to connect during this time when we were all kind of scattered to the winds and working from home. And it was um, that second listserv was always um, great fun to have, especially when participants wanted to share kind of um, quirky little things that they would come across during the transcription. Nobody asked me about what uh, quirky little things came up because I can't think of any right now off the top of my head, um, but I'll definitely be thinking that as, as I go further into the presentation. 
Um, and, and for the lessons learned, um, throughout the process, as, as you can imagine, we encountered unanticipated issues and problems in this process of solving or figuring out a solution to issues that arose, we learned a few lessons ourselves. And um, I will say this right now that probably none of these lessons are new um, and are probably not unfamiliar to anyone, but they really are important and worth repeating. And I wanna do that kind of within um, and frame that within the project. Um, projects. Uh, the first thing that we learned was you can't prepare for anything, uh, everything, or anything. Um, I'm not sure when it was, but at some point it, it became very clear that there was going to be a strong possibility that we would be working from home. Um, it was at the point um, it was at that point we began to kind of start identifying projects to work from home, but Clemson, like many institutions, closed very rapidly after Governor McMaster's did his declaration on March 15th. So we lost a lot of time um, that we had anticipated having, which meant we weren't able to survey a lot of the collections or projects that we wanted to do ahead of time. And it ultimately kind of resulted in us not having the time that we you know, would have liked to have had for the transcription projects. And a lot of things had to be handled ad hoc. So we couldn't really work through various scenarios. We did that as in an iterative process, um, which was which was fine. Um, but I, I, and I think many people do like to plan and prepare for things, but that just really um, wasn't in the cards for us. So the reality is, is you can't prepare for everything. Um, we also learned, um, even going into it, knowing that communication is key, but we learned that even more when we had set up that first listserv, we set it up with the intention that, you know, we needed to give the participants a way to easily contact us um, regarding specific questions and about the process. And it didn't take us too long to figure out there needed to be a second listserv to one, push information out for us because we were constantly refining those guidelines and documents based on something that's some issue that that somebody ran into where we realized we had a blind spot or a gap in our documentation so we were able to incorporate their the solution to that issue into our documentation and then we were able to push that back out to the rest of the participants and then and again we also learned that participants really needed that space to talk to each other and and again hitting back on that training as a subcomponent again huge um, and I think in hindsight what we should have done and what we originally thought to do um, was to create uh, videos um, short and sweet videos training videos that people could watch and refer back to as needed um, as I mentioned this was something that was on our to-do list but like with so many things in this past spring and summer it it just didn't happen and um, it just didn't happen, but I think that would have also um, gone a long way to um, to helping people work through the process. But it was it was a lot of fun to hold those smaller trainings as well. Um, another lesson learned was know your participants or volunteers. As I mentioned at the height of the project, we had 37 participants and our participants ranged from library faculty, library staff, library student workers. And while we might've known who our participants were, we, we knew they worked in a library, but we really didn't know their backgrounds or skills. One of our participants who was a student ended up um, actually having been a professional transcriber and had their own foot pedal and everything. So they were really familiar with it. We had students that were really techni technologically savvy, really understood how to use Box, Trello. Um, we had staff that were familiar with um, the context of the materials we were using, so interviewees, also the documents themselves. And that's all to say they, they brought their own skill sets to the party. And in order to kind of balance out all those things of like what they brought to the table and what maybe they lacked, um, we needed to, to keep things simple and keep participation in the project as low barrier as possible. And so I think really understanding uh, and knowing your participants or volunteers was, was very important and keep learning about them as you go through the process. The next two um, lessons that we also learned, I think go hand in hand. 
at the start of our project, uh, we didn't really have a, a good idea of how long we were going to be working from home. Heck, we're still working from home. Um, what reopening was going to look like, if we'd be able to have students continue over the summer, when and if people were going to get pulled off of the project. So everything was up in the air. And what we kept on, you know, trying to think and tell ourselves as we were building out the documentation, as we were figuring out the projects, was to make them as sustainable as possible so that if someone got pulled away or if our situation ended and we had a vac magical vaccine for COVID um, and, and we, we were able to pick up the project and move it forward. So we were trying to be sus sustainable with our project planning. And also that really taught us to, to be nimble and be flexible. And again, I think it goes against our, you know, certainly went against my need to constantly prepare for everything, but just allowing um, nimbleness in, in our work was a lesson that we learned. And then the last one is that we, um, we can replicate the project. I think this really served as a good proof of concept that we can launch these uh, transcription projects and uh, it made us comfortable with the fact of we could have people work on um, these projects that maybe aren't trained librarians or haven't worked in archives or a library that we could we could have this replicated and um, and done more widely. And um, as of as of this week, the document transcription has um, had it has either completed or has in progress thirty six different projects with that's totaled 808 pages transcribed and for the oral histories we've had um, 24 oral histories that have been in process with uh, 732 pages transcribed and now we would just open it up for any questions what questions do you have Don't forget to put them in the chat. Uh, I gotta find the chat. So many screens. You can put comments in the chat too, as long as they're nice ones. Just kidding. All I right. knew they would all be nice. <laughs> ah, we've got a question from Anne. How has university administration or alumni viewed this project? Positive feedback? Well, uh, since uh, I, I, well, our dean has been very supportive of it. Um, I don't know how far up in university administration um, has knows about the projects um, because they they still are kind of like an internal work in progress. But I I would assume and um, maybe. Jim might know or I, our head of special collections is also on this call, but um, I, I could imagine that they would be very excited. Um, the, the collections that we have really go to support our curricular endeavors, which is at the very heart of the mission of Clemson University and, and what we do in the libraries to support um, the learning of our, of our student body. So I would assume that they would be extremely positive. Um, and I think it, you know, and it also creates an administrative um, good for them. Um, they can go back, look at those earlier um, faculty uh, minutes, look at Board of Trustees materials, um, and can find maybe answers that they've been looking for themselves, but I would I would assume that it would be positive feedback. Anything that makes our collections more accessible to the larger South Carolina community and for our students to do some good, um, you know, archival primary source research 
um, I would say they would be happy, but I don't know how far it has been shared. Again, it's more of still an internal project because we're still working on it. Um, comment from, from Anne uh, that it sounds like a great project that as you keep moving forward, that it needs advertising for lack of a better word. <laughs> um, next question is from from Josh Johnson. What will be the availability of these transcriptions be after the projects are finished? Strictly in-house research or will they be published online? I think I'll take this one. Um, the, certainly for the written documents, since those are already in Tiger Prince, those would certainly go online because most people can't you know, read 19th century, 18th century handwriting. Um, so it will be a great supplement to what's actually there. I would also expect that the oral history transcriptions would also uh, go online at the same time that the uh, oral histories themselves go online. But yeah, I figure they'll be online. This isn't. This is. This is to improve, you know, discoverability and accessibility and. We can't do that just by keeping those kinds of things in house. Right. And I will just add for the oral histories. Um, yes, as Br and Brenda mentioned something in the chat as well. I think, you know, some of it is going to, at least for the oral histories, we will, you know, go back and look through the transcriptions. Um, part of the process is um, both our project leads, um, they go through uh, a two, two reviewer process and then us as project leads will take a third pass through um, to to read the transcriptions. And I think it's at that point, you know, we would flag, and again, this is probably more for the, the oral histories, we would flag anything that is, um, that, that might be, I don't know, a violation of third party um, privacy or just, you know, checking uh, for, for just a few things. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that they um, are shared and available as widely accessible as they can be. And as, as Brenda mentioned in the chat, that we're in the midst of creating a better system to access our online content. Um, so they will, um, so this work will uh, be launched with that. Well, we are excited for you to look into it too, Josh. <laughs> and Brenda added, the university has been very receptive of the project and benefits it's creating. Yes. Thank you for adding that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? Brenda said the, that according according to the university archives rock. Yes, we, are, we do. We are rock stars. We're getting close to the end. Got to get that that question in there under the wire. You have three minutes. Dun, yeah. Dun, dun. <laughs> Well, I guess I, I guess I should say that uh, Krista mentioned our kind of three-step process. Um, you know, it gets transcribed, then we have a reviewer one, we have a reviewer two, and we have editorial review. And one of the nice things about about uh, Trello is that when you were working on that project, 
you just move the card to whatever column uh, you need. So that's that's one of the great advantages. It's it's very simple to to realize. Oh, I'm finished with this. Now I can move it to this next slot in the process. Um, and have a comment from Anne with a thank you and that there are things in this that I feel I can adapt in my situation here. And that's great because that was part of the reason why we wanted to share share this so that other people could benefit from it. And I think, um, and I'll, I may speak for Jim, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we are, you know, if, if anybody wants uh, you know, copies of the templates or things that we've created or want to follow up with us, we will definitely, um, we'll definitely do that. Um, do, and this is a question from Brenda, do you see this easily transferring um, into a crowdsource project, similar workflow? I think so. I think there's um, opportunity for us to go in and tweak, do some tweaking. I think um, some of it will, if we push it out to a larger audience, is to think about how we can um, provide access with credentialing. I think um, most of the tools that we use would still allow us to do that um, with our setup here and allow us to have control over that. I think we will want to um, have some more kind of like a may have to rethink quality assurance, um, thinking about things like accountability in that um, process. Um, but I think we can definitely see it transferring to a crowdsourcing type of project. I just think some of the parameters of the project and the documentation will need to be refined a little bit. Yeah, and I would, I would there are a lot of crowdsourcing, you know, software out there. Uh, and it probably would be a good idea to look, you know, across those and see the kinds of things that they uh, uh, generally require or think is a good idea and then see, well, you know, is that something that we can uh, adapt uh, to the process that we have here. But yeah, I think that, that this, would, this would work for crowdsourcing really do. Well, we're at two o'clock. Um, time for a break uh, before the next session, which will start at three. Um, pardon me, 2.15. Uh, so we want to thank you all for, for attending. Um, and onward to the next session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chat. Thank you. Good job.